Delighted now to be joined by Limerick and Kim Alex Senior Herder, uh, Barry Hennessy on the Backdoor GA podcast. Um, Barry, you have a nice Movember coming along. I would definitely like to give it a bit of a shave the other evening. So, um, so yeah, just it was growing down into my mouth. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. It was great to be part of it. Um, just a little, I suppose a little fun thing we were doing to club, and it was great to, to raise awareness for it as well. So, um, glad glad to be a part of it in one sense. But uh, I'd be glad when it's over too. So, yeah, you've all obviously been doing it in Kilmallock, and I suppose the awareness, I suppose around November for mental health it's it's great to see I suppose lots of GA players and everyone getting involved yeah um I think uh, mental health issue especially with the, the male population would have been a bit of a you know a stigma there a couple of years that have been a stigma attached to it so um it's great to see the openness with people um especially with fellows obviously of course uh in the last couple of years and it's great to see the GA you know to get behind it as well you know you see that's um, all over social media from different counties and different clubs and parishes getting involved in it and it's it's great to highlight it because they said there was that was a taboo subject a couple of years ago so um it's great that people can be open and and be able to talk about it you had your um on ireland medal ceremony last weekend i seen i suppose was it it was it's it's probably great in one sense for you all to get together i suppose just with the i suppose times we're in and COVID getting worse that you were able to I suppose come together for that event yeah um, we had it last Saturday night I suppose it's been cancelled um, I think it's been cancelled three or four times out to stage ball so it was great um, I think we were probably a week we were okay to have it by about a week I'd say if we were to, due to have it this week or next week even I'd say it might be kind of hit because you know we were due to have a civic ceremony in Limerick and it had to be cancelled um, tomorrow so we were just uh, we were just got it by the skin of our teeth, you know. So it was great to meet the lads. Um, I suppose a lot of us had been socialised anyway and had been in our bubble for for so long. So uh, I don't think there was any fear or danger there amongst us anyway, you know. So and everything was done in a very controlled, professional manager uh, manner inside the Strand Hotel as well. So, um, you know, we obviously put the trust in, in them and they they came up trumps. So when you do get presented, I suppose with the medal, I suppose. What's the feeling like? Um, it, it's pretty surreal, I suppose, when you, you know, going back to 2018, you got your first one, you, know, you, were, you were kind of in awe of it. Um, it's something you've been chasing for so long that you were dreaming in the back garden when you were only four or five years of age to have it in your hand. Um, and then to get your medals again the other night, you know, I suppose we'd gone so long without, um, without getting them, you kind of forgot what it felt like in one way. Um, but in another way then I think you're part of such an ambitious group that you kind of just close the lid down on your, your box then and kind of part it and say, look, there'll be time to look at this in maybe 10-15 years time when you're finished up you know um, whereas now it's about just the moment and you know trying to win as much more as we can you know and um, trying to keep in that mindset um, because I suppose if you're looking too far back behind you at all the time at what you've won you're, you're at risk of of letting it there, you know, and um, not being in the present moment and not enjoying the present moment and going after it. So, um, there'll be plenty of time to look at those, Paul, in a couple of years' time. But for now, it's just focus on getting back anyway, number one, and just putting our best foot forward and training hard and see can we put ourselves in a position again to, to win another one um, and mm-hmm. not talk about anything else further after that. So, and you've obviously had a great year with the club so far. Have, have you enjoyed being back? Uh, I suppose with that club and I suppose maybe the kind of I suppose second season of this uh, split season yeah um, I suppose you start with your club and you know your performances with your club get you to a higher level um, obviously with your county but I think it was it was great that the refuse were able to that have been involved with Limerick in the last couple of years were able to go back and play with our clubs in the summertime and play challenge matches Um you know, which we would never would have had our league game even in Kilmarnock, like you know, the, and to play the league game in Kilmarnock in I don't know how many years. But it's always great to be able to go back to the challenge matches with the lads and play those league games and, and be involved around the club again, you know, and not just float in for two weeks before the first round of the championship, play a couple of games, then float back out, then and come back maybe in three or four months' time when everything's over with Limerick and give another maybe a week, two weeks to go train again before the, the business and the championship starts, you know. So it's been great and I think this year um, 
uh, like Tony, Tony Constantine is back with us for second year. Um, Tony would have brought great success with him in 2010. Um, we hadn't won one since 94 and Tony brought standards back up and landed the first one for us in you know, that many years um, and brought another one in 2012. So Tony kind of has the, the the wow factor, the traumatic factor about him. So he, um, it was great to be, I think, landed another one again, again with Tony, you know, that came from what he brought and the standards and the, the buy in then from the players as well. So um it's great to be winning with your club, you know. Um these are the guys you went to school with or you know, the lads that you may have been coaching at one point at underage. So they're all little special things, you know, and it's great to give that back into the community then as well during such a, a hard time for everyone. You mentioned that floating previously uh between county and club. Would you have found that hard when you're with Limerick floating in a week or two before championship or maybe even the odd league game? Yeah, um, I, look, I think club lads understand in one sense, but then you it, it's very hard to come back and drive standards sometimes, you know, or to give your top and sports and on something when you haven't been involved or haven't done the hard slog maybe with the lads, you know, and you sometimes may feel like a bit of an outsider. When you come back in, and it's it, it it's it's very hard on players on both sides, you know, um, because you know, the last thing you want to know is one flag coming back in, and he's he's roaring and ball, and they're looking at him going, "Oh, sure, the county lad is back now," you know, he's he's there taking over, like kind of a thing, or um, you kind of don't want that division, uh, you know. So it's it's actually great to be to be there to do all the hard training with the lads, you know, to suffer with them and do all the work that they're doing. Um, it just makes it a little bit more special, it makes you feel as well part of it a little bit more. So. And would you find a big difference between Limerick and the club or do you just feel the way the club game has actually gone the last few years that there isn't much of a difference? No, obviously things like the speed and the speed and the skill level are probably just a little bit ahead of the club game um, in terms of the county game. But the club, the club game got so professional over the last couple of years that like all the clubs are now have an SNC, either a person or a team in place, you know, either nutritionists and dietitians or access to them. Um, every club has a gym or you know, some sort of a hurling wall you know, so the, the club, club has got really really professional and in terms of training and training load um, you're probably doing the same amount with your club that you're doing with your county like you know so there's times where we've done more with the club than we've done with, with the county like so um, the club game has got really really professional in the last couple of years and I think it's just coming back to I suppose that adaption um, that, and the exposure to, to coaching that underage players are getting um, that they're especially club level that they're able to just come through that a little bit not necessarily sooner because I know there's the age restrictions and rules in place to play, play going from junior to adults but um, like they're exposed to such a high level of coaching that they just fit seamlessly into into a senior setup like you know their development is a lot better than what it would have been when, when we were 15 and 16 year olds that had no access to gym or didn't the only gym you knew was a fellow called gym maybe down the road you know, <laughs> so so yeah and um... A great year for you this year um, for Kilmallock, obviously, but I suppose in the Limerick Championship, it's been one hell of a journey for you. Yeah, um, I suppose in the Pierce, you beat us in the first game. Um, they got a couple of goals and they kind of might have flattered the result a little bit. So it was actually a very good performance for us. Um, and then we went out the second night in kind of a do or die match that we had to win against Belly Brown and we were we started fairly poorly, to be honest. Um Conceded a few soft scores and we were kind of chasing all the way up to I think nearly the 62nd or 63rd minute and we managed to get our noses in front um, and luckily for us uh, Barry Brown and Mr Free the last, I think it was either the last or the second last puck of the game um, which the young lad Leo Connors in fairness to him he'd been, he'd been on fire all night with him and um, fortunately for us he missed his his last free and we managed to hold on and it kind of Built a bit of momentum from there then that the kind of the belief that maybe command of teams in the last four or five years would have folded at that stage and not been able to come back from that, you know, and just throwing in the towel earlier in the game. Um, and that went on to the liberties again with the extra time, came through that. And I think we, we started probably peaked in it at the most important time of the year for us. You know, we put in a great performance against Dune and carried that, that confidence into the final against Patrick as well. Um, and put a, put together a very, a very solid team performance. Um, against Patrick as well so you know it kind of we peaked at the right stage I suppose um, and gained that momentum through the group stages which was which was crucial for us and you mentioned like throughout the, throughout that that maybe Kilmallock teams might have folded but the balance you have this year I suppose between 
the more experienced players than yourself, Graham Mulcahy, Paulie O'Brien, Gavin O'Mahony, Philip O'Loughlin, but even the young lads that are stepping up, I suppose the people wouldn't know maybe outside of Limerick and particularly Mike Hoolan as well this year and players like that. Yeah, um, I think when you go back into the, the club game, like you, I don't know, there's not necessarily no reliance on the, the inter-county lads maybe in a team. Um, if you go back to finals, it's always the lads, we won't call them fringe players, but it's the other the other lads that have, uh, probably aren't inter-county players that are very, very good club players and that aren't that far away from being inter-county players. They're the lads that, that win the big games. You know? And if you went around to go to inter-county lads, so the man of the team that, and county final, that, like the lads, they're, they put in a way better performance than the inter-county lads did. You know? So you're Kieran O'Connor, like... He did a great job on Keane. Um, you know, O'Shane Michal, as you said there, like Nerves of Steel, popping freeze over from free, you know, popping points over from freeze all day. Um, you know, Liam English, then Joy, you go around there. So all those lads stepped up, you know, and did, did what was required and did more, even, you know. So um, they're, the, they're the lads that are, um, that are very important to club teams and they're the lads um, that I suppose bring the success to the club teams. If you look at it, I suppose your team maybe at the start of the year without Paddy O'Loughlin and Jake Mulcahy, you might have said that she'd struggle. But is that one of the differences this year, as you mentioned, driving the standards and maybe there's no excuses? Yeah, and I suppose you've a panel there as well. Um, I suppose it's, it's Jake's second year out of the panel. He's a massive, massive club player. Um, a massive player for us over the years. You know, Going back through all the finals that we won in the early 2010s, he'd come up with... You know, a goal against the Dare to win us one in twenty fourteen. Like he he had some very crucial moments for us. Um Paddy the same. Paddy's a, a massive player for, for any team, you know, not in terms of just his size, but just everything that he brings. Um he, he's a massive player for any club team to lose. But again, it was kind of a case of okay, next man up. Um who's gonna be the guy that's gonna just take over? Um and like Kieran took over, I suppose, for Paddy there. Uh, really established himself this year. Um, Michal, Jake used to be the free taker in the team. Michal stepped up to the freeze and um, banging him over all year. And very, very consistent with that, you know. So um, I think it was the, it's probably the first time in a while where we've had that panel that we can call in the next man and trust the next man. And we've 32 or three lads on our panel ball that, you know, you trust anyone to play. Like, you know, everyone's chomping at the bit to to get out and play the next day as well, which is which is great. Like, you know, and it brings that competitiveness to training. And it just keeps lads in their toes and as well that you can't get comfortable. Um, and in fairness to Tony, you'll never be comfortable anyway. You know, you're kind of half awesome looking over your shoulder. So um, let's, let's see what the next man is doing to make sure that you're you're doing the same, if not more, to hold on to your spot. So. And there's no sign of, I suppose, Paddy or Jake coming back for the Munster campaign? Um, I know Jake. Um, Jake won't be, I'd say. Um, I think Paddy Paddy's done a bit of training, so we'll see we'll see what the story is with Paddy. He's doing a bit of training, right? But that's just kind of the extent of it at the moment. So, obviously, great to win um the county title, uh this year. But I suppose you kind of was it twenty fourteen your last one when you really went on to the All Ireland final. Did you feel maybe underachieved? But I suppose then you look at the forces of. Nick Pearcy, particularly in Limerick the last few years, and Patrick Swell, who um, gave you a great battle as well in the county final. Yeah, um, I suppose there was, a, there was a stat I hadn't really paid much attention to until I don't know, someone said it to me the week before the final that um, we contested was it 10 semi finals in a row or 11 semi finals we've got, and then in between we got the finals as well. So um, you'd with the group of players that we had, you would say, being honest about it, you probably would say we've underachieved a little bit, you know, um, for for the group, because I suppose our group was, we had a very successful underage team that was winning 14, 16 minors. I think there was four in a row under 21, there's lads that had that. Um, so we thought that we'd bring it to senior and sure senior such a different level and different ball game. That I think I checked the panel in 2007. Um, and we won the first one in 10 and we thought she's great this is great and we'll win one every year we didn't win one in 11 we came back in 12 last one again in 13 came back in 14 and then it got fairly barren there for seven years and um, we weren't far away we were kind of always getting to that semi-final that final stage but we could just never kick on and and it just comes back to Limerick got so competitive you know, in the pier she drove the standards completely through the roof in Limerick um, in what they were doing and they got phenomenal success from that and the, the input and buy-in they got from their group 
and then you did the emergence of Patrick Swell and do two very, very young panels. Um, you know, littered with intercounty talent there all over the place, you know. So um Limerick was actually very, very competitive and you throw a into the mix, then you throw South Liberties into the mix, you know. Um there isn't actually that much between the two um senior divisions or two senior um sections in, in Limerick, you know, everyone's fairly competitive there. So and I think it's transpired in how healthy the the county game is or the intercounty team is. Um I think Limerick are obviously very competitive in the intercounty scene now. Um, and that's filtered back to the club. So it's you know it's it's a kind of a they're a testament to each other and how well both are operating, you know, and how at such a high level they're operating at. And when you did win the county title this year, did it make you realise how special the club game is when you see, I suppose, a community like that on on the pitch and everything and the celebrations a few days after it as well? Yeah. Um I suppose it goes back to it's your parish, it's your club, you know, it's your family, it's your close friends. Um, you know, it's, it's probably the people that you'd see regularly and on the street in the town or in the shop or, you know, and what it brought to them. Um, because I suppose there has been a lot of, there's been a lot of suffering and there's no point saying otherwise with COVID and the last couple of years and people have struggled, I suppose, with lockdowns and, and not getting to games and no crowds at games. So I think for to be there to win a, win the first county, I think, with a crowd. Um, so it, was, it was a really, really special moment for for all of us, you know, just to be able to share that with people, um, and then share it with everyone back in Clannock again. Like we we do a kind of a, a parade up through the town. Um, any team that wins, they do kind of a parade up through the town. John, you're you're brought up to the the hurling field. So like that's that's they're the moments you 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 play for, like you know, to to see those people and be part of that, be part of the 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 history as well in the town, the clubs. So. Your attention obviously uh, focuses now towards Munster. Where you have to wait till the 12th of December for that clash um, against Middleton. How have you found that long of a wait for, I suppose, this game? Um, it's actually been okay because I just sent you off air there that um, we've had a couple of challenge games in the last couple of weeks as well, which has been great. You know, it's broken up the week for us. Um, but I suppose... We've been waiting seven years to get back into the Munster Club campaign, you know, and to be training at this time of the year. And it's just kind of the only teams left in the club seen training at this time of the year are the, the champions, you know. So um, we're very cognizant that we're representing Limerick. Um, that we're at the stage now, we're representing County as well as our, our, our club as well, you know. So um, it's it's an opportunity that you're not going to take for granted. Um, and they're the opportunities that you want as well. So um, you're just, you're you're happy to be in this position and to be able to go out and train um, because it's quite a privileged position that only one team every year gets to do it from Limerick so in the senior ranks now um, so it's, it's it's been great and it's something you'll always look forward to normally you would look forward to the, the cold and dark evenings but it's, it's great to be able to do it now at this time of the year and it really does have the potential to be a cracking contest when I suppose you see the performance Middleton put in uh, last weekend in the county final against the Glen. Yeah, um, look, they're they're a really good hurling team. Um, again, littered with intercounty talent, and as well as that, they've got some very good <coughs> uh, club players. Excuse me. Um, we played them in a challenge match during the summer already. You know, and it was probably one of the best games we played all year. So it has that potential, as you said, to be uh, a great contest. So hopefully, the weather just stays cold and it doesn't get wet and mucky over the next couple of weeks, so that we can really have a a, a good game. Because I think any game that we've kind of played in the Munster Championship, that I played in uh, the Munster Club Championship, we've um. It has been good games, you know, so it'd be great to add another one to the list. As you mentioned uh, there, like, it's great to be fair to Kim Malloch and play in this time of year, but if you weren't, you'd probably be going back training with Limerick soon enough. But when you go back in, I suppose, the early months, the early weeks in December or January, is that something where you, some people mightn't realise the sacrifices that inter-county players put in because it's obviously not an easy place to go back in December or January training away um, in fairness to John and his backroom team they've, they've mined us really well Paul over the last few years like they, they're very they're very aware that we're, we're people first before players um, they've given us every opportunity to enjoy our Christmases to enjoy our breaks um, compared to when I first joined the panel you would have been back probably in October after the, the club um, county final um, so you would have had nearly a full season or you'd have six months done 
um, before the, you get a break for the club and then you'll be going back in. That's just with the league, I suppose, and the, the Munster League and then you get a break and you're, you're back into the championship mode then after that. So you could have had eight, nine months of training done by the time the championship finished, you know. Um, whereas now, we might get a gym program and lads might get um, just a bit of work to tip away on themselves and then depending on John then he'll try he always in fairness to him he's very aware that lads need to enjoy their time with their family and their friends um, and they'll bring us back probably as late as possible you know so they did at the start of the year as well this year after the success we had at Christmas time in 2020 he left it literally until the last week that he knew that we would could possibly take it to um, before we went back so uh, in fairness they always get the balance right and you know, we we trust that, um, and we've hundred percent trust in him. So we know whatever he decides, it's going to be the the right thing for for the group. Yeah, it's obviously been fighting for your success. I've seen a couple of Limerick players talking as well. Like I suppose during the off season, how important they feel it is sometimes just switching off from hurling at times. Yeah, um, again, it comes back to I suppose we're, we're people first, um, before your players. You know, and. It's very important for lads to have, I suppose, their off the field stuff sorted in terms of career or college or family relationships, whatever it is, and to have a healthy, healthy balance there. Um, because better people will make better players. And you know, some motto would the New Zealand team use. Um, so they are very conscious of that, you know, and they would encourage that. And even back to, to Caroline Corrid, like she'd she'd encourage you that when you're not training, like that you're you're switching off from it, that you're completely detached from it. That you're doing things that interest you, you know, that you're trying to better yourself, um, whether that's educationally or in your workplace or whatever it is, um, and just not, you know, being full on with hurling all the time. So, and when you came in at the start, like you mentioned, there, I suppose, starting in October, but as a major realized, maybe, I suppose, under the John Kiley management, like that, I suppose, maybe at the start that hurling was everything, but that, I suppose. As you said there with Caroline Kerr, like that there is stuff outside of it. Yeah. Um I suppose when going back to the early two thousands and tens onwards, I, I joined the band in two thousand and ten and was off it again to probably fourteen and came back in from fourteen to where to now this year. Um and I suppose at the early part of your career, it was always a case of you had to live like a monk, that you had a certain standard, to you know that you you were afraid to go to the cinema, that you were afraid to eat a bar of chocolate, you know, that you couldn't be seen going into a takeaway or couldn't be seen at a party in a pub, you know, that these were the things that you had to do. Um, whereas now, you know, I suppose from Dean with Caroline and the level of experience and professionalism that she brings, um, like she, she's completely told us to do, to do things we enjoy in our downtime, to switch off, to relax, you know, to just to make sure that we're experiencing life outside of that, like, you know, um, that there is more to life outside of that. And she tried to encourage lads to do that, like, um, to find something that just, I suppose, keeps them grounded and brings that interaction between their their personal life and their sport and life to and brings them closer together rather than you know, driving them further apart. Um, because I think in past times, by the time the end of the season came, lads were just absolutely mentally drained um, because there was so much other stuff that they were focusing on rather than focusing on their training and their hurling. And their performance has probably obviously suffered and because of it, you know. Um, I know personally it did for me for a couple of years like you know you were just so dialed in and you were so focused and just trying to get better and better and better that you were actually getting worse you know because you were just so, so focused on things that you couldn't control and you know focus on things like or you know, just unneeded things that you didn't need to worry about you know um, instead of just focusing on the, the bread and butter and the, the hurling aspect of it and getting that hard to it right so um, there's been a, a major shift in my opinion that you know so and it comes back to John and Caroline again for creating that culture in the team and creating that dynamic so and for you there you mentioned that struggle you might have had was that just thinking of situations that might even happen in the game and uh, no, i was just it wasn't even to do with game it was kind of off field stuff like you know where you were just um you were more folks as i said you were there you were more folks about where you're going to be seen going to take where you're going to be seen the shop getting something you shouldn't be eating or but someone said that if you're getting it for someone else but they think it was for you like just little silly things like that you know, um, rather than trusting the team and trusting, you know, and trusting your SNC and your nutrition guys that, you know, if they tell you to do something, it's for the, the good of you, John, to go to the team, like, John, to trust that. So. And you mentioned the trust there. Um, but the, you obviously have a fantastic management team, but like 
you, you mentioned that you are people out off the hurling pitch, but do you feel that's one of the most key factors of why you are such a successful team at the moment? Um, there's probably a very good group there um, in terms of players, but there is equally as good a, a management set up there. Like John has surrounded himself with some, like John is a, a phenomenal manager. Um, and you can see why he's a, a school, a secondary school principal. Um, he surrounded himself with top class professionals in his coaches and selectors, and then with his backroom team, from physios down to the masseuses, to, to, to Joe O'Connell, the kit manager, you know, everyone in that group is of the highest standards and of the, the highest of professional and bring it such a professional approach that like you know so um i think that's obviously what john envisaged his group to be that they wanted to be super professional and you know he's driven the standards of that professionalism and you know it's it just shows in the group like that that's, that's just the way we are and they're the standards we've set and that's what we just expect from each other um you know those standards are what we expect and no one has gone off off, uh, off topic or gone away from those like so and you came in in 2010, as uh, you've mentioned, and obviously a real uh, successful period at, at the moment for Limerick. But does it make you realise not to, I suppose, when you are getting all this success, not to take it for granted? Because I suppose you're one of those players who probably has experienced more defeats than Limerick than victories. Yeah, um, I suppose... 10, we were kind of always, that's what 10 was a strike here, and that, that was what it was, John, it is what it is, and just, we've got our own history for what it was. Um, but even after, like, we, I suppose we weren't a million miles away, kind of 14, 15, and 16, um, and even 17 when John came in, you know, um, but you've you've experienced a fair enough, uh, a fair amount of defeats to, to let the younger lads know that, look, well, this is great now that if you take right off the ball, like we did in 19, and um, we kind of took our right off the ball for a while. Um, and maybe didn't train or draw standards as as high as we should have. Um, and Kilkenny caught us, you know. So um, we've probably relevant reference points in the last couple of years for the entire squad that have probably been part of it to know that you know it'll only take one team or one five minutes or ten minutes of a slip up, um, and we could be caught and it could be all over and it could all come crashing down, you know. And the tip game this year, for example, on Parky in Parky Cueve, you know, we were. Like 30 minutes away from a different season, you know, so it just shows you how close it is. Like, you referenced a te- uh, tip game there, but that's second half performance. Like, when, when you're looking on uh, and you see what you've witnessed, it must have been something else, yeah. And I think the great thing was, um, very similar to what I said about Kamanak a while ago, that maybe Limerick teams kind of in 14, 15, 16, even 17 probably would have just taken the, the foot off the gas a little bit and said, right, look, it's not our day, but should win the towel. Um, but we kind of just stuck to our guns. There was no panic. You know, there was no roaring and shouting in the dressing room at half time. Um, everything was very cool, very calculated. And we just said, look, we just need to just chip away at this, keep going, do the right things. Because you know? we were doing the right things. We were trying to do the right things in the first half. They just tipped them out and they were they played unbelievably well. Um, and didn't give us an opportunity, I suppose, to get our platform going. And we just said we'd chip away at it and come out in the second half. And we didn't think that we'd overturn it that quickly. Um, but again, <clears throat> excuse me, it showed that when we're off it, what can happen to us and it showed then when we do put our mind to them but you know when everyone works in cohesion and works together what we're capable of doing um, so it was a great again I use the word reference point for us that you know, just shows us like, that this is what we can do but equally if we're not on it that you know it's it, it's unnecessarily close like so You've obviously been um, battling out with the number one spot with, with Nicky Quay but does it give you great satisfaction when you see Nicky Quay play well, knowing that you're driving uh, him on in training, I'd be laughing because um, people are always be asking you, you know, um, do you ever wish that he'd make a mistake or drop a ball or, you know, and you're kind of there going, no. And they'll be looking at you with 10 heads, like, and you're kind of there going, sure, we're part of the team. Like, you know, it's a team dynamic. Um, and as you said there, if I'm going well, it means Nicky's going well. And if Nicky's going well, it means I'm going well, you know. And, like I've been really privileged to play with Nicky since we were 14 years of age, you know, at this stage. And to be able to train with him, I suppose I spend more time nearly with Nicky and with Jason and I too at home with Emily, you know. Um, so it's it's great to um it's great to say for myself and Jason, um Jason Glenn to win this year and to push and over the last two years to be able to push Nicky and make sure that he's he's operating at such a high level and then like 
to see his performances and in games, you know, it gives you great satisfaction because you know that you've contributed to that, like, you know. Um, and you know, he's such a he's such a top class guy then as well that he'd let you know, like, you know, geez, you, you've done really well there the last couple of weeks and you've really made me dig it out of myself, you know. So it's um it's great to see him performing well. And when he's performing well, then the team performs well, you know, because he, he pulls the strings for us, you know. So um you couldn't be happier for him the last last year again and all certain like Please God, you'd hope he gets another one this year. You know, he's 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 more than deserved it. And the way, even I suppose, from a goalkeeping um, perspective, which we're kind of talking about at the minute, has it surprised you how much of I suppose an evolution in goalkeeping and learning there has been over I suppose the last few years? Um, yeah, I suppose it, that kind of started in maybe in thousands, like you know, when you don't look music there, but then Cummins, David Fitz, David Fitzhenry, um. You know, those guys all kind of started that that revolution, I suppose, of it, and the evolution of it. And then you look at Stephen Clarkson in the football then as well. Um, like they've all changed the the face of goalkeeping. Um, it's not anymore that the, the goalkeepers, the the heavy lads that couldn't make it out the field, it's just throwing into goals. Like you know, um, lads are as fit if not fitter than than the outfield players. You know, they're in good a condition if not better condition, train harder, maybe train longer. Like um. Then the outfield players, like I know that we're in maybe 45 minutes before the outfield players start. Um, and we're in an hour even before you might be doing some analysis and you, you start trading maybe 30, 40 minutes before them and you're still there when they finish, like, you know, so it, like it's, it's changed massively. Um, but again, I suppose it, it has in a way because it, it's become so specialised. Um, you're, you're nearly a seventh defender now at this stage, you know, you've got to be comfortable on the ball and on and off the ball, really. So it's not just a case of standing there anymore, just hitting the ball out as long as you can and you know, hoping that the ball hits you. you know, there's a lot more that's involved than those. So, um, but yeah, it's 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 massively changed and massively evolved in the last couple of years. And you can see from the I suppose the, the quality of goalkeepers that are there now um, around the country, and that's both number ones and number sixteens, and even the the third place keepers that um, panels carry, like any one of those, any one of those guys um, could play for any county. Do you know, that's the, the standard that the goalkeeping has got to. So. Particularly from a puck out perspective, like I suppose when a team maybe does put that full press or maybe you can struggle, I suppose, from retaining possession from a puck out. Like, how do you prepare yourself for that? Like, even during a game, if you're given an obstacle like that? I suppose you're just, you do your analysis during the week, you'll have a look at what a way the forward set up. Um, like, that's, I suppose, the perfect situation and the ideal situation um, that that would happen then at the weekend, but it often doesn't. And teams might throw a curveball at you, and I suppose you're relying then on your your stats team to, to come down with the information to you through a hurley carrier or at halftime and um, just have a quick look over and say, look, this is where we're, we're doing okay, or this is where we need to change things. Um, but again, I suppose a lot of it is experience too. You kind of know, you know yourself from from playing the defenses and different styles of defenses. You know that um, you just know by instinct when you can you can go along or when you need to push art um, and pull them back in a little bit. Or you're looking for what way they're defending, or they're defending outside channels, or they're defending the inside channels. You know, so I think it's a lot of it comes back to kind of your video analysis and your stats guys, but then the experience that you probably have from playing. Um, playing games and playing certain teams, you know how they they want to defend it. So it's kind of play the moment and play what's in front of you. Um, but again, be coachable and not be afraid to listen to to feedback. And when you do look back, maybe on uh, particularly, I suppose last year for Limerick, do you feel that was one of your best years, particularly throughout the championship? Um, I suppose throughout the championship. We got incrementally better. Like I think John has used that in a lot of his interviews. You know, I suppose that's what we look for every day. Um, whether it was training in a challenge game or in-house games or even championship matches, we just look to get better every day. And every time we came to the Yellow Grounds or came to to represent Limerick on a bigger stage, it was just get better every day. Um, in terms of the manner, I suppose of winning it, it was probably I won't say it was a complete performance. Um. Because there was stuff obviously we can still work on, and there was mistakes that we made too. Like you know, but I suppose in terms of over the years, it was probably one that you could enjoy maybe a little bit more because we knew with maybe five minutes to go we had it won. You know, whereas maybe last year or twenty twenty, it still kind of came down to the wire. Or even twenty eighteen, you know, there was only a couple of ball and at the end, you know. So, um, it was probably a little bit nicer to be able to to enjoy the five minutes and all that we'd done it. 
um, and they'll be putting in such a great performance. But again, like you're playing someone like Cork, who are extremely skillful, that in five minutes could do a lot of damage, you know. So you're you're still kind of biting the fingernails in that sense, then as well. So. And like you talk about Cork being skillful, but like a lot of people talk, I suppose, in the media and different places about Limerick's system. But one thing your system really lets your players do is express themselves, that even if you take for Keane Lynch, like the skills he pulled off throughout the championship. Yeah, um, I suppose people kind of thought we were maybe a bit robotic that we had to play it a certain way or we were coached a certain way, but like we're encouraged to do um, to play out in front of you, you know, to trust yourself and back yourself and back your skill set, you know, and like that's coming right down from John at the top and Paul, you know, to, to the coaches, like they're encouraging you to, to play what you see. Um, obviously, we have we have certain values that we that we try to uphold in every game, like you know, and either that's attacking values or defensive values. But um, once they're once you stay out inside those values, you're encouraged to play play and what's in front of you, like you know, to express yourself and enjoy it and. I think a lot of the big thing with us is we're enjoying the ball. Um, like you see lads going around there with a smile on your face in front of 82,000 people or whatever when Pro Park was full, like, or even this year, 40,000 people, like Keane was going around flicking the ball into his hand, smiling. Do you know, so it just shows you like that like, there's a man that's enjoying himself. And Keane, like for Keane, for example, when he's enjoying himself, he's he's a magician. Like, you know, he's an absolute wizard with the, the ball in his early. So. Does it ever happen in training where sometimes you might have to stand back? From what he does when you see the skills he pulls off, uh, come here, it's across the board, you know. It's um, you've you got Peter Casey comes in and shimmies one way, next minute the ball is at the bottom of the post, and you're just there and going, How did he do that? You know, and yeah. David Dempsey, same could come through and finishes the ball past you in a one on one situation that you're 99.9% sure that you've got blocked, and he's only the one guy that could do what he's just done there, you know. Um, to Kyle, you know, you go around the squad. I think every single person that's inside there, they're just their unique traits about them, you know, that they can do just things that that they can do themselves, you know, that's very specific to them, like you know. So it's it's, it's crazy to be involved in such a uh, such a high standard of a team, like you know, because every lad inside there is just a fantastic hurler. Like, and you talk about the strength of the team, and you mentioned David Dempsey there, like he didn't even start in the All Ireland final, but your A versus B games in house must be something else. Yeah, they're they're in fairness. They're um again it comes back to when John took over, like John, they've been they've been that competitive since since John took over in 2017. Like John, they've been um they've been really, really, really good games. Um and again it comes back to the like it's an A versus B game. Um it's not a mixed game as such, you know, it's literally it's the A's versus the B's and more often than that when the B's are winning, um while that's when the A team is winning the, the trophies, you know. So even up the week of the all earning final, like the B team beat the A team um in our last in house game. Like so it just shows you like that when we drop the standards um and push the lads really, really hard, we knew that please God that they were going to face on, on Sunday or a Saturday that they were prepared prepared for, you know. So um and again, it just kind of goes back to what I said about Nikki, like that when the B team were going well, the A team were, were going to play out of their skin, like, you know, so. And just briefly, like, looking at the championship this year, um, I suppose whatever Kilmallock does uh, finish up, there won't be much of a rest. We've seen the round robin being brought in and the All-Ireland final this year in July. Yeah, um, Actually, look, well, that's that's July. I think well, I'm more worried about now the December the twelfth and getting to there and after that, whatever happens, whatever. Um, if if John decides that, um, I'm required to come back in, um, because you can't take it for granted that you're going to be brought back in. Um, if John sees I still have something to offer and brings me back in, uh, we'll we'll cross that bridge when it comes to it. So. Barry Hennessy, um, thanks a million for your time and uh. Best of luck for the rest of the season. Thanks, Bob.